Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve is in a timely series called Dreams and Detours, Lessons from the Life of Joseph, a life that fell into a pit, but he escaped through continued faithfulness. Join us today for the message, How Did I Get in This Pit? We're in a series on the life of Joseph called Dreams and Detours. You remember, Joseph was the one that God gave him a dream that his brothers were going to bow down to him. Joseph is the 11th son of his father, Jacob. Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel, had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joseph is the favorite son. Joseph is the son, as the Bible says, the son of his old age. Joseph is the first son of the, the wife that he loved the most, Rachel. And uh, Jacob put all his focus on this one son, Joseph. And the brothers didn't like that, and they didn't like Joseph, and they let it be known in Genesis chapter 37. I'll begin reading in verse 12. It says, then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Israel and Jacob are the same person, said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. That was 50 miles. That was a long trip. It would have taken him probably three days or so to do that. And a man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, they have moved from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Dothan was another 15 miles. So he had traveled 65 miles to go check on his brothers. Verse 18, when they saw him, his brothers saw him from a distance they could tell it was Joseph because Joseph had a long coat of many colors that daddy gave him. Didn't give any of the other brothers anything, but gave one to Joseph because he loved Joseph so much. So they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to him, they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, Reuben is the oldest son. He's the firstborn son. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, his, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. Joseph had come a long way to check on his brothers, and when he meets his brothers, they abuse him. They strip him of that robe that was a symbol of his dad's favoritism, and they throw him in a pit. Hey, what do you do when the bottom drops out? You don't expect it to happen, but it does, and you find yourself in a deep, dark pit. What are we to do? There are three imperatives that I want you to see in this passage. Imperative number one. Imperative means you must do it. Imperative number one, take a long, hard look at yourself. A long, hard, sober look in the mirror. Maybe you're here today and you are in a pit. You'd say, uh, Jeff, you know, I'm going through a, a terrible test. It's a, it's a severe test, and I feel like I'm in a pit. What am I supposed to do? Well, look in the mirror. Look at yourself. As the book, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, says, every great company, the CEO and the board of directors, they have to ask we, they have to face the brutal facts. They have to look in the mirror and say, what are we really? What's our company really? And every person has to do that. 
especially when you're in the pit, it's time for some evaluation. And you ask yourself some hard questions that we don't normally like to ask ourselves. A question like this, what did I do to bring about this pitiful situation? You're there in the pit, and you say, well, what did I do? Lord, what, what was my fault? What was my guilt in this? How did I end up in this pit? Was it something that I said? Was it something that I did? Job knew a lot about pits. Job had uh, some of the worst pit experiences that anyone has ever uh, gone through in life. You read his story in the book of Job, you find out that Job lost all his wealth and he lost all his children all at the same time. And then Job lost all his uh, health, just boom, just like that. And he was covered head to toe, toe in sore boils. And he was sitting in the ash heap, scraping himself with a piece of pottery. And Job wanted to know, uh, what have I done? He asked the question in Job 6, 24, show me how I, I have erred. He's, he's in a terrible pit. What have I done, Lord? Show me. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me. God, show me, is there something wrong within me? But the first question, what did I do to bring about this pitiful situation? The second question, what shall I do about this pitiful situation? So I asked the first question, why am I here? What did I do? And then I asked the question, well, what shall I do now? Job's wife told him, Job, you need to curse God and die. You're in a terrible, horrible pit, and everything, life just stinks, and why don't you just curse God and die? Well, that's one option, not a good option, not good to do. And, and you know what Job did? Job asked the question 18 times in the book of Job. He asked the question, why? Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? We do that all the time. That's normal, natural. Jesus upon the cross cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So it's normal, it's natural to ask the Lord, Why? Why am I in this terrible situation? Why am I facing this terrible, horrible test? Why do I not see any way to get out of this? But you know what? God doesn't normally answer why. He doesn't answer that question. God is not in the business of explaining. He's in the business of sustaining. 99.9% .9 of the time when you and I ask why, we just hear silence from the Lord. He doesn't answer, typically doesn't answer the question why. So why is not that great a question? You know what's a better question? A better question is how, Lord? How do you want to use this in my life? Another good question is what, Lord? What do you want me to do now? When you find yourself in a deep, dark pit, the very first look, take a long look at yourself. Second imperative, take a long look at the situation. Now, as Joseph no doubt looked at himself, did I do something, Lord, to cause my brothers to do this to me? Uh, Lord, as I look within, I don't really see that there's a lot going on there, that there's a lot of, of uh, fault on Joseph's part that would cause him to be in this terrible situation where his brothers are talking about killing him. So then he looks at the situation, and we, we back up and we say, okay, what can I learn from this whole situation? And you know, Joseph's problems, they began way before Joseph was even born because Joseph was born into a dysfunctional family. Here is Joseph's family tree. Jacob had his wife Leah, she was the one that he got saddled with. He, he, she was the one he got uh, tricked into marrying because he loved Rachel, the third one over there. He loved her. He thought he was marrying her, but her dad did a switcheroo and put uh, Leah, her older sister, into the bridal chamber, into the honeymoon uh, chamber there. And when, Jacob, or when uh, Jacob woke up, he was like, wait a minute, I thought I was marrying uh, thought I was marrying Rachel, and here I got Leah. Remember we said Leah was, was uh, she looked a lot better in the dark. And so Leah, he gets her, and he's like, ah. And so he says to Daddy Laban, Laban was Leah's daddy and Rachel's daddy, he said, hey, you, you 
swindled me. He said, I want to marry Rachel. And he said, work for me for seven more years and you can marry Rachel. And so he has Leah, and Leah has six sons. You see the sons there. And Rachel can't have any kids, and so Rachel gives her maid Bilhah to Jacob and says, have children with her, and since she's my maid, they're kind of be like my kids. And so Bilhah has two kids, Dan and Naphtali, and then uh, Leah sees that, and Leah says, well, wait, you take my maid, Zilpah, and you have some children by Zilpah. And so Zilpah had Gad and Asher. And then God opens up Rachel's room, womb, and Rachel has two boys, and she has Joseph in a coat of many colors to show him, and then the youngest, Benjamin. And so it's a dysfunctional family. Listen, when you have four wives and four sets of kids from these four different women, and you're all kind of living together, major dysfunction, major dysfunction. So family dysfunction produces family disaster. You can mark that down. Now, here's the thing that we see from this family. And, and multiple wives was not, uh, in that time frame, it was never God's plan, but it was very culturally accepted. And so things were very, very different back in this time period that we're talking about. Uh, obviously, that doesn't work for today, although many people have that situation where like, well, I was married to this one, we had two kids, and then I divorced her and married to this other one, we got two kids, and then I'm over here and I'm over there. And some people have never been married, and they have uh, four, five, six kids by four, five, six different guys. What a mess. What a mess. Well, that was kind of Jacob's situation. But here's the thing that made his family dysfunctional. Not only that, that's a big one, but... Jacob was a passive dad. Listen, guys, all you dads, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot be passive in your family. It's not going to work. God has called dads to be the leader in the home. He's called husbands to love their wives. And when a husband loves his wife and they have kids, then he is to lead in the family, and we have lots of families where the wife leads the family. The wife wears the pants, and the husband tends to just kind of back off and say, as one man told me, he said, well, you know, I handle everything from the mailbox out into the world, and she handles everything from the mailbox into the house. She takes care of the homestead and all the things that go on at home, and I just go out and slay the dragons and make the money. And when I come home uh, after slaying the dragons and making the money, I just come home and kind of uh, pour myself a cocktail and sit on the couch and don't do anything. And he thought that was okay. That's not okay. It's not okay. God has called a man to lead his family. He's called a father to lead his children. Dads can't be passive, and parents cannot play favorites. That's a big part of the trouble in this family is that Jacob was playing favorites. He came from a family that played favorites. You know, Jacob had a brother, a twin brother. His name was Esau. And Esau was daddy's favorite. And Jacob was mama's favorite. Esau was a hairy guy. He was an outdoorsman. And his dad, Isaac, loved that about him. He's a man's man. And Jacob was a smooth man. Esau was a hunter, an outdoorsman. And, and Jacob was like an interior decorator. He was, just, he was just different. And so he was a mama's boy. And his brother Esau was a daddy's boy. And so he grew up uh, in this family that had favorites. And so he had favorites. And Joseph was his favorite. The scripture says that Joseph was born at a time when his father Israel was very old. So Israel loved him more than he loved his other sons. Jacob gave him a special coat which was long and very beautiful. The coat of many colors. It was a big deal to get a coat like that from daddy. He's the only one that got it. Here's Reuben, the oldest son. Didn't get anything. What'd you get for Christmas, Reuben? I got nothing. I think I'm going to go see Bilhah. I mean, that was what was going on in his head. He was a little upset about that, that he didn't get anything. And this number 11 son, this Johnny come lately to the family, he gets his dad, dad's affection. Parents can't play favorites, but they played favorites in Joseph's home. And you know what that created? That created jealousy and bitterness 
and hatred. And that was what was in Joseph's home. Jealousy, bitterness, and hatred. And jealousy, bitterness, and hatred produces the worst of evils. The worst of evils. That's what was brewing in Joseph's home. Now, look what happened in the rest of our story. It says in verse 25, then they sat down to eat a meal. They threw him in a pit, and the Bible tells us that Joseph was crying out to his brothers in distress. They even said that later on in Genesis 42. They said, we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us to not do what we were doing to him, throwing him in the pit. No doubt, he's 17, and all your older brothers, Reuben is probably about 12 years older than, than Joseph, and so his brothers are all older than he is, and he's one against 10 of them, and they're all, they all have blood in their eye. They all want to kill him. And so he's crying out to them, hey, bro, don't do this. But what did they do? They sat down to eat a meal. They could care less about him. And it says, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt, 20 shekels of silver. They sold Jesus for 30 shekels, 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver. They sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Chuck Swindoll says they sold him like he was a crippled slave. 20 pieces only brought, that's what a crippled slave bought. They sold Joseph on the cheap because they said he isn't worth much. Verse 29, now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. And he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood and they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Where would you find it? Well, we ripped it off Joseph, but they didn't tell that part. They just said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Now I want you to see what jealousy and bitterness does to your heart. It hardens your heart like a rock. You don't care about the cries of your half-brother. You could care less. You'll sell him for uh, a new car, for, for a, a moped. You, you, it's 20 pieces of silver. It does, it's not even the price of a full-blown slave. Sell him for cheap and then lie and deceive your dad and watch your dad cry his eyes out, and you know the truth, but you make him believe a lie. Notice, it's very interesting how they did this because they never lied, boldly lied to their father. They deceived their father. They deceived him. They said, we found this tunic. As I told you, they found it on Joseph. They ripped it off him, but we found this, and they put goat's blood on it, and they said, look to see, is that, is that your son's? He said, yeah. And he was the one that made the connection. He must have gotten devoured by a wild animal. They tried to comfort him, but can you imagine lying to your dad and seeing him weep for his son? And you don't care one little bit. That's the dysfunctional family. Jealousy and bitterness, hatred produce the worst of evils. Hey, you take a look at yourself, you take a look at the situation, and very quickly, you take a look, most importantly, at the Lord. So I'm in this pit, and I look within, and then I look at my situation, and I look without, what do I learn about that? And then most important of all, I look up, and I look to the Lord, and I say, God, what are you going to do in my situation? Now, the devil lives in every pit. And every time you go into a pit, every time I go into a pit, you can mark it down. The devil is going to be in that pit too. And he's going to be whispering in your ear, and he's going to be telling you, hey, why do you think you're in here? 
You, be, you trust God? You believe in God? What a joke. God doesn't love you. God doesn't give a rip about you. God's not going to work in your life. Your brothers are talking about killing you. And if they don't kill you, they're going to sell you as a slave. And so what you need to do is curse God and die. Now, it's very, very critical as you look to the Lord that you remember two things. Number one, remember that God is good and he loves you. God is good and he loves you. They said when they dedicated the temple and the glory of the Lord fell on the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 4, the people fell on their face and the priest said, truly he is good, truly his loving kindness is everlasting. And you need to take those words and you, as I've told you before, you chisel those in stone in your heart and you just know that you know that you know that you know that God is good and God loves you and I don't care what the circumstances say, that is true. And here's what we tend to do. We tend to look at the character of God and evaluate the character of God through the lens of our circumstances. And if your circumstances are good, you see God and you say, God's a good God because everything's coming up roses for me. But if your circumstances are bad and circumstances go up and down, and if you hit a lull and the circumstances are bad and that's how you evaluate the character of God through the lens of your circumstances, you say, well, things are bad, so God must not love me and God must not be good. You need to turn that around. Evaluate your circumstances through the lens of the character of God. And the character of God says, God is good and God loves me and that's how I'm looking at these things happening to me. I don't understand why I'm in this pit. God, I didn't do anything to be in this pit. But I know you love me, and I know you're good, and I know you're still in charge, and I know you have a plan. And so, God, I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you, and that's what Joseph did. You know, Joseph didn't have Romans 8, 28 to cling to. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He didn't know that verse, yet he knew that verse. Because he said in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, as this whole story closes out, and you fast forward uh, 40 years, he says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Somebody may have done something to you, and they really tried to hurt you, and maybe you were sexually abused, and they meant evil to you, but God is a God who can take the worst of what people do, and he can turn it around for good. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, and God used it for good. And I'm going to trust God no matter what. My friend, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does, and he wants to help. He wants to make a difference, and it all starts when you open the door of your heart to him. Many watching know about God, but maybe you don't really know God in a real and personal way. If that's true, today is the day for you. Simply pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart to you. I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, change me, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message from Pastor Jeff Shreve, How Did I Get in This Pit, is from his timely series, Dreams and Detours, Lessons from the Life of Joseph. Find out how to get your copy when you call 877 877- 777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Do you have a God-given dream? 
a vision or picture that God has put in your heart about your future and what he wants you to do in life? Hey, has that dream been detoured, especially in these last few months? Has that caused you to become bitter? Or are you learning to trust God even more? That's what Joseph did in the book of Genesis. He trusted God to fulfill his dream, no matter the setbacks. This month, I have three key resources that I believe can help you better navigate the detours that have interrupted your life and help you get safely through these storms. They include my series, Dreams and Detours, Lessons from the Life of Joseph. Secondly, my book, Life Interrupted, How to Face a New Normal. And then lastly, the new series, Storms, What to Do in Troubled Times. These are available for your generous support to From His Heart by June 30th. We're hoping to end our fiscal year on a strong note and reach our financial goal of 175,000 this month that will help us recover from both the fire that destroyed our offices back in March and the pandemic that shut our offices down. Will you help us with a gift this month? Remember, I take no income from this ministry. I'm a volunteer and a generous monthly supporter. That means that every dollar you give goes to reaching more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks for your support. I greatly appreciate you. Dreams and Detours, Lessons from the Life of Joseph, and the book Life Interrupted, How to Face a New Normal, are our gifts of thanks for your support of $30 or more this month. And for your gift of $60 or more, we'll also include the new series from Pastor Jeff entitled Storms, what to do in troubled times. Call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Thanks for your support by June 30th to help us close out our fiscal year, able to impact more in 2020. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.